You're watching the Video Revolution Podcast from Primo Productions. ability of Cabot Robert to add pupil knowledge to product knowledge has earned him the reputation of a number one speaker in America in the field of human engineering and motivation. He has devoted his life to helping people bring their do-how up to their know-how. Helping people to realize that regardless of what they do, first and foremost, they are in the people business. In 1972, he received the coveted Golden Gavel Award presented by Toastmasters International to the nation's outstanding speaker in the field of leadership and communication. Walter Cronkite and Lowell Thomas were former winners. He has also been awarded the Oscar of America's Professional Salesman. He has authored several books and over a dozen inspirational recordings. Mr. Roberts' vast knowledge in sales and human relations is drawn from a wide background of experience. He has sold insurance and real estate for over 20 years, held sales schools and conducted courses in sales, human engineering, personal development, and management for many of the nation's outstanding companies. Cabot Robert was born in Starkville, Mississippi. He received his BA degree from the University of Mississippi and a degree in law from Washington and Lee University, Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, Cabot Robert. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, everybody loves a beautiful introduction. Only one thing wrong about it. It helps the guy only up until the time he opens his mouth. And then he becomes a very lonesome soul. I hope the good Lord in his infinite mercy forgives us both. You for your exaggeration. Me for being such a ham for loving it so. You know, I always did like to hear other people read the introductions that I wrote about myself. But as long as his conscience was going to let him read it. I don't know why he didn't read it all. I wanted you people to know a few of my small accomplishments. I at least wanted you to know that I had been ghostwriter for Henry Kissinger, gag writer for Bob Hope, romantic advisor for Elizabeth Taylor. I am the only authentic executor of the will of Howard Hughes, and sometimes I'm the spiritual consultant for both the Pope and the Ecumenical Council. In addition to all those things, my friends, you're going to hear a very modest person. You know, I promise you, I'm not going to try to get up and impress you today. Long ago, I joined these disciples who feel that a man should never try to give good advice until he's too old to set a bad example. Now, I'm not quite that old. And if you'd been with me the other night in Honolulu, when Merlin Cundiff and I put on a big seminar for about 1,200 people, they, you would know that I am not, I am not that old. They had a luau. You ever been to a luau? I'd never been to one. Gee, they came in with roasted pigs, and everywhere you'd look, they were handing you free lemonade, free lemonade, free lemonade. I found out the next day they called them Mai Tais, Mai Tais. And I don't mind telling you, my friend, I am not one of these weak individuals who yields to the temptation of depriving himself of a pleasure. But I can say this, the way my head felt the next morning, at my age, if you're going to fly with the eagles in the morning, you better not hoot with owls all night. All right, make me one promise, will you please? If any of you walk through these doors with any cloak of cynicism, a garment of sophistication, please take it off. Please let your hair down. Don't have any preconceived ideas. Look, don't have the closed mind of some of our Arizona cowboys, bless their heart. I love them. I do a lot of hunting and fishing with them, but so help me God. Most of them still think the airplane and the automobile are just gimmicks to drive the price of horses down. Or don't be like this lady who said to me the other day, yes, Cabot, I will listen with an open mind and an unbiased attitude to this simple, stupid, haywire scheme of yours. So if you live up to your bargain, and if I live up to mine, then whether you emerge inspired or whether you awake and refreshed, I'll feel your time and mine has not been in vain. I'll try to give you something maybe you can relate to a better life or a better living. Whenever I hear a guy say, I'll try, it reminds me that every doctor remembers his first operation, and every lawyer remembers his first lawsuit. Now, my first lawsuit was in Lexington, Virginia. Old Judge Glasgow 
kind of the Judge Beam of Virginia, appointed me 60 days after I finished law school at Washington Lee University to defend a man 90 years old who had committed a double murder. He shot his wife, and then he killed his son-in-law. Now, whenever a judge appoints you, you don't say, yeah, yeah, now you just do it. And I did it. First case it ever had. Thought I did a pretty good job. I got the guy 20 years, which really isn't so bad for a double murder. But I remember so well, this dear little fellow, 90 years old, leaning on his little cane in front of Judge Glasgow. I really kind of got to love the guy. I was kind of sentimental about my first lawsuit. I used to take him cookies down to the penitentiary. Remember Judge Grasco said, now before I pronounce sentence on you, have you got anything to say? He said, yes, Judge Grasco, I have. I can't serve 20 years. I can't do it. I'm 90 years old now. I remember Judge Grasco looked at him. He said, but my good man, you can try, and we're going to help you. <laughs> so I want to say this. I'm going to try to sell you on a little different approach to selling, but you got to help me. And the way you can help, please, I repeat, be my jury. Don't bring in a verdict until all the evidence is in. I mean, do you know who is the richest person in this room? I mean it. I think it's a guy or gal that's having a love affair with a job. Why? I'll tell you why. You never work another day as long as you live. You look forward to Mondays as much as Friday. You like the old tramp with the beat-up tin can. Here's to the holidays, all 365 of them. I mean, I would tolerate a person in my organization with anything outside of dishonesty. Before I'd have the guy gal always on the wrecking crew. Always bad mouthing sales. Walk around like they've been weaned on a pickle. You've seen the type. Gee, they, uh, you'd think they were the cruise director for the Titanic. I'm going to give you the best piece of advice in selling right now. And this is the second principle of this human erring program that we teach. And that is this. Are you ready for it? Don't tell people your trouble. 80% couldn't care less. And the other 20% are actually glad. They are to find anyone more miserable than they are. If people ever ask you, how's business, what you going to say? Great. great. You bet. And you're not lying either, my friends, because it's always great somewhere with somebody. And if it's not great with you, I got news for you. They're going to look for that somebody. Oh, no, my friend. They won't tell you why. They'll give you a sham objection. Got to ask Aunt Tenny, Uncle Fuller. Oh, my friends, psychologists say we are afraid to buy from losers. Ken McFarlane, the great speaker, I know many of you have heard him. He tells about the guy that ordered a lobster, and it came with only one claw. He hit the ceiling, called the waiter, what's the matter with my lobster? Got only one claw, the claw's the best part. He said, I don't know, he must have been in a fight. He said, you just take this one back, bring me the winner. <laughs> my friend, everybody wants to buy from a winner. Do you know the worst thing that happened to anyone in this room? I mean it. Next to losing your life or losing a loved one. Get to the point where you're not so excited about what you're doing, so proud of this great company of yours, that you no longer lift people up to your plateau of excitement. You gravitate down to their complacency. My friends, when that happens to you, you are dead while you're still alive. I got a salesperson that works for me that prays every morning, dear Lord, please never let me die until I'm dead. I was speaking <clears throat> The SME club down in Dallas, Texas, not too long ago. And I was down at the airport at 6 o'clock in the morning and having breakfast. And I was sitting right across from a guy that was smoking a cigar and eating scrambled eggs. Now, I love cigars. In fact, I just bummed one a while ago. I'll have one before the day is over. Then I love scrambled eggs. But not at the same time at 6 o'clock in the morning. You try it sometime. Or try enjoying your breakfast, watching a guy chew up the cigar with the scrambled eggs and blowing cigar smoke all over your orange juice. A sweet little girl walked up to me, kind of sweet smile like uh, yours, Mildred, put her hand on my shoulder, looked down and smiled at me. She was pretty inside and out. And she said, sir, isn't it a beautiful day? I looked around and it was. I felt ashamed of myself. I said, bless your heart, honey. Thank you for reminding me. I promise you I'll remind myself tomorrow morning. She walked over to this turkey put her hand on her shoulder, shoulder and start pouring coffee. She said, it's a great day, sir, isn't it? He never looked at me and scrambled eggs. He growled through his cigar, what the devil's so great about it? She just did a double take, smiled sweetly but firmly. She says, mister, you just ought to try missing a few and you'd find out. You know, <laughs> there's not a soul in this room who someday wouldn't give up all you own for a little bit more of this precious substance we call life. 
Every morning when we wake up, if we are not listed in the obituary column, we ought to be so grateful. We're just dancing all day long. I looked at that guy with a cigar in his mouth. I said, I finally found the guy who was weaned on a pickle. Yeah, I've gotten a guy who has mental B.O. I said, a guy like this just brightens up a whole room when he walks out of it. When a guy like that dies, we shouldn't put him in there. Bitcher, I call him, we ought to put him in civic improvement.